On April 29, 1945, soldiers from the 157th Infantry Regiment, 45th Infantry Division, made their way through a wooded area in southern Germany, near the town of Dachau, located just 10 miles northwest of Munich. The war was nearly at an end, but despite their years of combat, this would be the most gruesome thing they would encounter. It was part of an enormous complex created to bring death on an industrial scale known as a concentration camp. A long time ago, but I can still remember it like it happened yesterday. It was a very traumatic event. Uh, the, the troops were absolutely overwhelmed. Some were crying, some were cursing, and the smell of death was just overpowering. I risked my own life, but if I had to do it over again, it'd be the same way. Dachau was opened on March 22, 1933 as the first concentration camp for political prisoners. It opened just a few weeks after Adolf Hitler had been appointed the Reich Chancellor. The camp served as a model for all later concentration camps and as a so-called school of violence for the SS men who controlled the camp. The camp existed for 12 years and housed more than 200,000 prisoners in the main and subsidiary camps. 41,500 people lost their lives in these camps. On April 29, 1945, the men of the 157th Infantry Regiment, 45th Infantry Division, put Dachau to an end. The 157th Infantry Regiment's battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Felix Sparks, led the liberation of Dachau. At 9.22 a.m. on April 29, 1945, Sparks receives an order to take the Dachau concentration camp. Sparks, to put it mildly, is furious. This new assignment delays his move on Munich, and he has no idea what a concentration camp is. Now, from today's perspective, we all know. But back then, he's been in the war since 1943. He doesn't know. He doesn't want to lose his momentum in moving toward Munich, but he still has to follow orders and take the camp. He decides to gamble and split his forces. He will utilize the battalion task force reserve and lead it into Dachau, while the remainder of his forces will continue their push toward Munich. You will immediately proceed to the concentration camp at Dachau to take it, seize it, seal it off, and let no one in or out. Those were my specific orders. It is now noon, and Sparks has decided to take a route into the camp that is several blocks away from the main gate. We, did, uh, we came across a railroad track leading into the camp. It contained a number of railway cars. They were box, mostly box cars, but some open gondola type cars. Uh, we received no fire at all from any German troops. We approached those cars, and there were 39 cars, and each of them was filled with dead human bodies. We checked each car and found no signs of life. Although we did find two or three prisoners had strength enough to crawl out of the cars, and they were lying on the pavement alongside the railroad track, and it appeared that someone had taken a rifle butt and bashed their brains out on the pavement. Well, there was a long, dead silence. The, I could tell that the troops were very upset, very angry. Hardened American combat veterans go into shock at what they see. Several soldiers are crying, others are cursing, most are dumbstruck. Sparks arrives, and like many of Item Company's soldiers, he vomits at what he sees. After the horrific sights in the train boxcars where nearly 2,000 people died, Sparks orders his men, like technician fourth grade Joe Wilson, a combat medic, who that day was acting as a rifleman, to continue on into the camp. I saw all these guards and everything, and uh, I started to put up a fight. We laid about 13 or 14 of them on the ground. And then the rest of them give up. So we went on and we saw the concentration camp. We came out near the crematorium. As I looked at it, I saw one room stacked full of nude bodies, stacked like cordwood, and quite piled in, the, in this big cement room. And then as I moved on, I saw 
some furnaces. There were a total of five of them. Sparks and his men continued on to the main prisoner holding area. The prisoners inside realized that uh, something unusual was taking place. And then they came pouring out of their barracks. There were 34 barracks inside the enclosure. And then they started screaming, yelling. They were starving to death, just skin and bones. And uh, we told them to go to those houses. And we told the German people to feed them. They didn't like that. And <laughs> but they did, they fed them. And so I had all, all the people I had that could speak various languages yelling in there that they had to remain there. They could not, we could not let them out. Uh, that we would bring up medical help and food as rapidly as we could. So the whole camp quieted down and they just stood there and moved around a little bit, but very peaceful. And they didn't try to break out, as I was afraid they would try to do, because we were still in a combat configuration and we couldn't have thousands of people running around on a combat field. While Sparks and his men were liberating the camp on one side, the 42nd Infantry Division Assistant Commander, Brigadier General Henning Linden, drove up to Dachau's main gate with war correspondent Margaret Higgins. It was there that the camp was surrendered to Linden, as Sparks and his men were inside the camp engaged in combat. 2015 marks the 70th anniversary of Dachau's liberation. The Dachau Concentration Camp Memorial hosted a remembrance service and invited members of the Colorado and Oklahoma National Guard, Major General Robbie Asher, the Adjutant General for Oklahoma, and Major General H. Michael Edwards, the Adjutant General for Colorado, laid a wreath in the ceremony. And then we've had, there have been these soldiers that were here that were part of the liberation from the 42nd Division, from the 20th Division, and from the 45th Infantry Division that have been here and the opportunity to share with them and uh, be with them during this 70th anniversary is just, it's touched a special place in my heart and it'll, it's always gonna be there. The memorial ceremony hosted a number of Holocaust survivors like Jack Adler, a survivor of several concentration camps including Auschwitz and Dachau. The day, every daily food ration consisted of a slice of bread and a bowl of soup. People were dying from malnutrition, disease by the thousands. People were taken out to extermination camps, concentration camps by the thousands. Jack lost his entire family, mother, father, and two siblings in the Holocaust. After he was liberated, he moved to the United States and joined the U.S. Army, serving in the Korean War. When I went into the Army, they had a draft. And I, and I could have gotten an exemption because if you were in college, you could have gotten it. But I want to say, the only way I could say thank you is serve in the service. I talked to one survivor yesterday and, and he told me uh, the number of children he had and then the number of grandchildren he had. And if we wouldn't have shown up here on April 29th, 1945, 70 years ago, it, it would have not just been him that didn't survive, but generations after. American soldiers described Dachau as the hardest thing they would have to endure psychologically during World War II, but it also gave soldiers an understanding of why they had been fighting for so long. Many of us had been in hardened combat for almost two years and through some terrible combat in Italy, Anzio. So we were used to death. Death was nothing new to us. We had our own men killed almost every day. We saw German soldiers killed every day. But death on that scale of civilians was something straight from hell. And the horrors that they saw and what they encountered are just unbelievable to us. And we as members of the military the members of Oklahoma and the citizens of the United States, we can never forget this and what happened here in the tragedy. Yeah, it's horrible. It's 
think one man could be so cruel.